First with Britain. Good morning and thank you very much for joining us. I am Yori Folari. Uh, the Salah sort of is extending. We're in the middle of um, the whole uh, Salah break. Um, but it's good to have you with us. Now, our guest this morning, I think he's going to be uh, known by uh, most Nigerians because, um, uh, le let me tell you his name. His name is Mr. Babatunde Irukera. Mr. Irukera is the Executive Vice Chair and CEO of the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. Uh, earlier, before this name, uh, we sort of, it, it, it rolled off the tongue as Consumer Protection Council. Uh, but now uh, you, you've slipped in um, competition in there. Now it's now the Federal uh, Competition and Consumer Protection uh, Council. So first of all, good morning to you and thank you very much for coming. What was the good necessity? Morning. Why did you have to add? Because isn't it all consumer protection? Why was there a need to slip in? Well, prior to 2019, um, Nigeria didn't have a composite uh, central competition regulator. And the competition regulator also addresses fairness in the market. Um, okay. Prohibits uh, inappropriate conduct that distorts the market in a way that doesn't benefit consumers and doesn't allow other competitors to get in the market and play fairly. And so um, in 2019, the president signed into law a Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act. And it repealed the Consumer Protection Council Act and transmuted the then Consumer Protection Council to also be the host regulator. And it became the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. Mm, I see. Uh, so it's it's a bit more uh, brother. It, brother. It's, it's a it's a brother. brother. So the the law the law is a lot more robust with respect to consumer protection, and then it adds the new component of competition regulation. And so mergers and acquisitions would need to be approved by the competition regulator to be sure that that business combination would not distort the market. Mm -hmm. It investigate monopolies to ensure that. Um, Others are able to compete fairly in the market, and you would uh, look at all kinds of other conspiracies, cartel, and abuse of dominant market power. So there are quite a number of things on the competition regulation. And, and your council is charged with um, um, making inquiries and investigating um, all aspects of uh, w within the law uh, from the point of view of the consumer. Anything that was uh, that has made into law for the benefit of the consumer, um, your council. You know, certainly has the charge to. Yeah, the commission that. does that. Even the competition um, regulation, it's quite corporate. It's quite corporate, but in reality, at the end of the day, it's still something that redounds to the benefit of consumers. You want a fair market where people can fit, compete for the custom mm -hmm. of consumers. Mm -hmm. So, as innovation, as quality, so, so over, over, over promising and that kind of a thing. Uh, there are still more consumer protection issues, mm -hmm. but. When uh, a, a, a big company wants to buy all the other small companies okay. in the same market, okay. you want to buy up competitors, or when you engage in certain conspiracies to shut down their business, or you do predatory pricing. Mm. For mm. instance, because you have market power, you floor prices, or because you're entering into a market, you have a lot of cash, or you're subsidized, you just go and sell products at a price that is unreasonably low, okay. just to push others out of the market. So that's and not allowed? Oh, it's against Because the it, 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 on the face of it, would look like a, a fair a, a fair. Initially thing. it does, but to the extent that you're selling something at a price that's unreasonable, that's a loss, well. then what it is is that the objective is you want to push others out of the market. Okay. And when that happens, then you have the prerogative and the discretion to increase prices anyhow. Okay. So it, ultimately, it will redound against the benefit of consumers. Indeed. And in and, and this particular uh, example that you, you spoke upon, uh, unfortunately, the, the consumer doesn't really look at low pricing. It's, low pricing is good pricing to, <laughs> to him or her. Of it's course. good pricing. And if, if everybody is selling at that price and you crash it down so that I that didn't have any access can now have access, but you're saying that there can be... Objective. Objective would ultimately be... So if you think that you can take 
some losses just to create name recognition and brand recognition for your product as you enter the market, would look at it. But if the objective clearly demonstrates that what you're trying to do is to push others out mm -hmm. so that you can dominate the space, the reasonable suspicion is that you were not created as an NGO. You're in this to make profit. To, to make a profit. And so if ultimately you need to make profit, once you're the only one in the market, prices would ultimately become unaffordable. I see. So, so uh, it would be a test that is based on many factors. The pricing just being the key factor that initiates the inquiry. And so there'll be a bunch of other things that we look at. You know, to, to be silly for a moment, um, so if, if we were to crash our advertising rates by 80%, you know, so you pay only 20%, you guys might find a need to investigate us, right? We would be interested in why, <laughs> and we would look at the whole context <laughs> and see. So, for instance, if you're new um, okay. and you want to really create brand recognition and say, we're going to operate like this just to get in the market and gain some attention, gain some of the market share, we would look at it. It's tricky, but it's a fine line. We'd look at it, but we would ultimately intervene if we come to the conclusion that what you're trying to do is to get others out of the market. Because the only reason why you want other people out of the market is so that you can ultimately act unilaterally. And any ability to act unilaterally is potentially dangerous. So you put potential monopolies under you know, a, a microscope? Put potential and existing. Both, both potential and existing. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I didn't say, but a lot of people will know that uh, Mr. Babatunde Rukera um, is a lawyer. He's also the executive vice chair, as I said at the beginning, and um, CEO of um, FCCPC, which is the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection uh, Agency. And what I have noticed that sort of, you know, has just grabbed me by way of introduction is that it, it looks like you head, you head up the prosecution. Is, is it right to refer to it as the prosecution? of, Because you, you head up, you're actively involved, you're in there. Um, what if you weren't a lawyer and able to do that? Well, in that case, then it would be some other people who are lawyers within the organization. I okay. think um, for me, my uh, record of experience is also as a litigator. And um, like every other person, you are going to bring what your previous experience is to bear on how you discharge your responsibilities in your work. Mm. And I, I'm not gun shy when it comes to litigation. <laughs> and I actually think that You can it's say that again. <laughs> uh, and, and so for some of the very important cases, and I, and I don't go to court for all the cases, but for the cases where I think it's important, and uh, not just businesses, but consumers and the entire market need to recognize how seriously we take the issues and I feel that I have the competence, then yes, I would certainly participate in the judicial process. Mm, because um, uh, I was just looking at social media, I saw some comments along the lines of, ah, this one that the executive uh, vice chair and CEO has taken up your case personally, you see when, meaning that it's going to be as thorough as can possibly be. Um, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> now, you put out a statement um, uh, this time uh, concerning two ladies, um, unfortunately, both, both of them you know, have passed in circumstances that um, um, require uh, to be investigated. Um, now, this, uh, I'm talking about uh, Mrs. Kweju uh, Uboma. Uh, she's a, you know, a chef. A, she was a chef, a baker, and she passed on in circumstances that you were in investigating. Uh, that happened at um, Premier. You, 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 you're invest making inquiries into the operations at Premier Hospital in Victoria Island. Actually, not only Premier, the record of information that we have uh, shows that she, was, she, she underwent a, a surgical uh, procedure in Premier. She yes. ultimately passed on at um, Evercare. Yes. And so we're looking at the whole... Okay, uh, because uh, there were a number of institutions and um, experts, you know, so-called consultants that were also involved. Correct. And um, the last time I saw your... Um, council on television, I, I saw that um, there are all sorts of categories of people that come to those kind of hearings. Uh, apart from the people concerned themselves, then you bring in um, um, expert witnesses. And, that is correct. Uh, you know, you bring in cons so that, you know, it, it seems it, it's, it's quite thorough. Thank it, you. It, it, it's quite thorough. Um, and at the end of the day, I guess, I want to ask what then happens? Uh, when you have now concluded the matter, do you now proceed to court or is that court enough? 
So there are three aspects to using this as an example, um, whether Ms. Mrs. Uboma or Ms. Uh, Omoya Jo, uh, three aspects to what is at play here. One, there is a professional aspect of it, which is the question of whether the uh, respective professionals engaged in misconduct or in some way, shape or form violated or failed the professional ethical standards. We don't look into that. Some of the evidence we develop might be relevant to that or some of the evidence developed in that investigation might be relevant to our work, but that's the exclusive preserve of the medical and dental council. Okay. And so that's the professional regulation aspect. There is the regulatory uh, aspect which is more the uh, consumer protection space, uh, the facility, whether applicable standard of care uh, was appropriate, whether it was sufficient sensitivity, responsiveness, and just how, you know, value for money, that whole uh, um, enterprise. That's what we investigate. There is a potential third aspect, which is uh, civil liability, mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. that it's quite possible that um, an injured party, in this case, sadly, the families of the uh, two uh, ladies who have since passed on can pursue additional civil remedies through the judicial process by filing an action in court okay. against whether the doctors or the insurance company or the facility or whoever else they think is potentially liable for damages. Um, and, and so there is some sense of congruence between what we do at the regulatory space and mm -hmm. then that. Our role is dwell in that regulatory space, we want to make sure that um, the environment is safe for others. And at the same time, we want to make sure that the person who's been injured also secures remedy. But it's quite possible that the remedy we provide or the remedy that we propose is inadequate for a plaintiff. And so they would have the prerogative to still go to court. And so our findings are administrative. Okay. And some of it is also, we could also make a compensation order. Okay. And which is likely to happen if we believe that uh, injury has been established, response liability has been established, and a reasonable understanding of what the value of that injury is arrived at in that administrative process. We're likely to also uh, make a finding or an order in that regard. But whatever our orders and our findings are, they're still administrative, they're still subject to judicial review. So whoever disagrees with us could go first to the um, con Competition and Consumer Protection Tribunal, or you could go to the Federal High Court. Okay, I mean, because I, I noticed that um, cases are marked as um, FGN versus... Uh, when we go to court, okay. yes, That's when we when go to court, okay. because we also prosecute cases. And so when we are prosecuting the case, we had federal government entity. That's the federal government. That's the state. And so we're prosecuting in the name of the state because it's a violation of law that the law otherwise provides criminal penalties for. So that's the state that is prosecuting you. We're just an agency of the state. But when we hold our own uh, investigation and uh, investigative hearings, you're still at an administrative uh, uh, level. And so it's not likely to be X against. It will just be an investigation into whatever the subject is. And in this connection, um, not all that you serve notice to appear uh, are happy to do so willingly, <laughs> uh, whereupon you have to get a bit more insistent, shall we say. And um, I, I noticed this in particular. I don't know if it's, a, it's not a present case. It's an ongoing case. Um, a, a Dr. Anu, for example. Correct. You know, she's... Um, well, she, I don't know if is or was is the right term to use a, a, a plastic surgeon, uh, but she's been suspended by the um, Nigeria Medical and Dental uh, Council. Yes. So, so, you know, pending when this will be resolved. Correct. Um, uh, now, that's another aspect. Of course, I was going to ask, can you enforce these things? But I got part of the answer in, 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 you know, in just checking out online that you did indeed compel this uh, what oh, yes. would they be called? Was it, would it be a witness? Uh, a target of investigation. Okay. Ta you did indeed compel them. And uh, the, the, one of the first things that they said was that they even had no business being here, which I understand was dismissed. Of you course. Know, they tried that. Of course. So, and so, so the riskiest thing any target or, uh, of investigation or anyone who is under summons can do is to um, disregard the summons. Okay. Because it's quite possible Which that this doctor did. Yes, this and doctor, what, Arno doctor Arno did. Should, and that's what she's been prosecuted for, by the way. We haven't even gotten to the point of the actual conduct. case. Yes, and she, uh, a professional conduct. She or anybody else could very well go to jail. 
for uh, not responding to a summons from the commission. And the reason is because that's the only way you protect the process. Um, look at what we do, consumer protection. Uh, it cuts across everything. It's very serious. And so anyone who will undermine that process not only undermines it for the purpose of their own benefit, they're essentially bringing the entire house down. And so if there's one area where um, we take very seriously and frown, it's those who are unwilling to comply with the institutionalized process for determining if something has gone wrong or not. I, I absolutely, we don't take any prisoners on that. We don't <laughs> cut any slacks. You, you're, if, if, if there's a legitimate and legal basis for us to proceed and you do not comply with the requirements for proceeding, we will prosecute. And those are the types of cases that I also consider very sensitive, and that's why I am the one prosecuting uh, this particular case you, re okay. you referred to yes. by myself. Yes, and, and, and um, it, it's been on for quite a while, I think, Last year. Last year, 2020. Last year. And, and it's right now it's been postponed till... Uh, right, so because actually we've had, we've had a court hearing that should have occurred, but there's a strike of judicial workers mm -hmm. that has uh, um, held things back. And so the judicial process has really been the reason why the case hasn't ended. But I'd say it has moved quite well. The judge kind of focused on it, uh, initial preliminary jurisdictional challenges to the jurisdiction of the court or the powers of the FCCPC to prosecute the case. The court quickly moved through that, dismissed the preliminary objections, uh, affirmed the powers of the FCCPC to prosecute the case, and we started taking evidence. Okay. Uh, one thing I noticed, I noticed something you posted um, that, look, the law is what it is. It, the its wheels tend to, can, can indeed be seen to grind very, very slowly in, in, on occasion. But the one thing that will not be allowed to happen is that it will not be allowed to grind to a halt. At least not under my watch. We will pursue it, and that's probably with respect to um, a case that I am also personally prosecuting in Uyu Akwaibom, okay. which is a people who were smuggling rice, and the rice was uh, um, was expired and uh, actually dangerous. And so they were bringing this rice through the creeks, and it turns out that some of them were very powerful people. They had able to they had spent over a year restraining the investigation, stopping us from getting in court, avoiding service. But I was determined to to. Uh, so we brought a crew from Abuja, even a police crew, and went out there. And so finally, when the case came before the court, I said, well, you know what? These guys have been able to hold us up, uh, delay us, but mm -hmm. they certainly will not simply succeed. Be, simply because everything must be done according to the law. According to and, the law. And um, if you have yeah. deep enough pockets, and uh, you can really yes, extend you can, that. You, you can know? exploit and, mm -hmm. you can exploit and uh, manipulate the legal system. Mm -hmm. um, it's very sad that people can do that in most other places, even that has a consequence. But I mean, on the one thing that I'm pretty certain about is that if we think that you've done something wrong, we will have our day in court. Now, what, what this says to me, what, what you've been telling us, sharing with us so far, is that um, really for the ordinary Nigerian, uh, thank God for FCCPC, uh, meaning we have a society where, you know, power is might, you know, deep pockets is might, and if you don't have anybody at court, so to speak, I'm not talking about legal, but you know what I mean, if you don't have anybody to, to help you, um, quite frankly, a lot of injustices will pass. Now, that seems to be one area you're standing in the vanguard saying that if we get a complaint... If or if we make a discovery. Okay. So it doesn't have to be by complaint. It doesn't have to be by complaint alone. Correct. You know, because um, I saw someone who said that they had sent a complaint on, on social media, on yes. Twitter. They had sent a complaint, uh, but that um, it, it had been ignored. But that was, you know, that assumption was... Um, um, sort of uh, addressed and corrected that um, maybe that was an oversight, but here are further ways that you could actually get in touch. Correct. I know. So and, and so um, the thing about it is that uh, one of the first things I did when I arrived at the police was to also pursue technology and uh, improve the uh, access mechanisms for feedback from consumers. And so uh, we created a complaint resolution enterprise system. And just from that, from approximately 700 complaints per annum, we're now doing over a thousand complaints per week. And so there, it's quite possible that there are complaints that um, we haven't gotten to as quickly really as possible, but we work on them as quickly as we possibly can. But what is even more so 
is the fact that the capacity with which we were handling the complaints has not increased much. So it's still the same number of people. Um, the entire FCCPC with its multiple offices across the country, 241 people. And so, and not all of them are in complaint resolution. Mm. You've got people who are in clerical work, you've got people who are driving, you've got people in legal, you've got people in quality assurance, you've got people in human resource administration, surveillance, enforcement, and complaint resolution. So maybe about a dozen or a little above a dozen people who are doing this work. COVID has also impacted because the government workers having to return home, ability to stay on top of these things, even under uh, um, emergency COVID protocols, has been a problem. And But we still keep working at it. We continue to persuade consumers to please uh, exercise some understanding, but we make no excuses, whatever the case may be. Mm. So, it, it, and I, I didn't know that, and it's good that I do, that um, it's not all by complaints. If you discover oh, yes. on your own you will action. The vast majority of our investigations are because we, you know, we gather intelligence or we see something and we just proceed and look and if we find something, we open an investigation. Hmm. And then issue the required summons. Yeah. Most of the outcomes of complaints is usually some resolution between the, um, the producer or provider and the complainant or consumer. Um, most investigations don't originate from complaint. I see. Uh, mm. But many complaints resolve without going to investigation. The reason why a complaint might become a matter of investigation is if we think it's a pattern or something that's very egregious or something that needs to be addressed industry-wide. Or else we'll be opening, I mean, if you're getting a thousand complaints, just imagine how many investigations you'll be opening. So investigations are a very high level, uh, an important tool and, uh, and something we take very seriously. The resources to investigate a case is very extensive, both in people, money, and all kinds of things. So we don't just pursue investigations. We are very targeted. And do you do preliminary investigations then to sort of determine if this is really going to be worth the power the, and the while and the, all the resources that you're going to have to devote to it that is not you know, a spurious uh, kind of a situation? Oh, trust me, by the time you hear or by the time we put something out that we're opening an investigation, it means that we've done some work. Mm -hmm. We've gathered intelligence, we've analyzed some okay. information, and we found what you call probable cause. Okay, and even then, what you are investigating um, in wanting to be fair to all sides is possible violations. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. Possible violations. Because even then, even if we've looked around and we found some information, sometimes we've really conducted uh, surveillance. Sometimes we've even gotten information from insiders and all of that. But until there's a full court play, until you're allowed to provide all the information. And there's some things that have looked suspicious. There's some things that appeared like violations of law. And through the investigative process, we've determined that that's no big deal. I mean, and sometimes it's, uh, it's not an issue. And there are some other things that we didn't set out for. Okay. And we opened an investigation and discovered some real big issues that were far bigger than what we set out to look for. And when that happens, we expand the investigation. Wow. Now, let me come to the present matter, even though I know that it might be sort of the number one in terms of what you're engaged with now. Uh, some of them are still ongoing. Yes. Uh, as I mentioned, the case of um, that um, Dr. Anu, that is an ongoing matter. Correct. Uh, but Peju Boma and Omolara uh, Omoya Joe, who arrived dead, you know, at uh, Beachland Specialist Hospital in Aripo, uh, Ogun State, and uh, in the unfortunate case of Mrs. Peju uh, Boma, her her matter was at a Premier Hospital uh, in Victoria Island. You you had said taking Mrs. Boma first, the late Mrs. Boma. There were a number of professionals and institutions or you know involved could correct you, could you just give me a summary please and so our understanding and i'm not going to be able to tell you everything i know yes i'm just going to understand yeah. mm. our understanding of this is mrs uboma presented at um, premier uh, uh, medical center and had a history there had consulted there and had prepared uh, and they had mutually set a date for an elective surgical procedure and that she went in for the elective surgical procedure mm, sorry um, because you will know an elective surgery. What does that mean? Meaning that she didn't have a life-threatening condition and that um, the surgical intervention wasn't something that was mandatory or required okay. 
to save her life. Okay. It was a procedure. She, she made the choice. She made the choice to, to okay. proceed. And um, it appears that uh, post-operation, she started to deteriorate over a period of time and um, complications arose. Ultimately, she had to be transferred to another facility where she ultimately and sadly passed away. And so there are a few questions yes. uh, based on what And she was done. paying money along the line. That is correct. You know, from the, after being paying first at Premier Hospital, when it was determined that she had to move to another hospital, they asked for more payment. Her husband, we read in the public domain, was quick to respond. Uh, a, a, a specialist consultant was also drafted onto the case. He required some monies as well. The husband was quick to respond. So all of these were going on. Yes. And it really, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that at the end of the day, they lost the patient. Sad. And, and so a few issues based on what we've seen and uh, some of the information that has come to us also. Questions about the clarity of information that was provided to the patient or the family of the patient. Uh, questions about the standard of care and the applicable standard of care and whether they uh, were receiving that standard of care. Question of the clarity and the transparency of the billing and what was being paid for under the services. And big questions about um, the responsiveness, it's how quickly they were acting okay. as issues were arising. In other words, how professional? Really? Does it come down to that? Well, to some extent, but primarily professional misconduct is something the NDCN would look at. We would look at, you know, um, your services, where, you, where your services, uh, did they meet the standard that is globally set or locally set? There's a health care act, um, there are other uh, basic standards of law, negligence. And then there are processes and standards that are statutorily set, including in the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act, about the quality of service and how the service is discharged, about the cost of service, about the reasonableness of the conditions of service. And so we would be looking at each of these factors to determine if something went wrong or not. It is quite possible that we can find things that went wrong um, that were not unprofessional. Okay. I don't know. Okay. That would be for the MDCN. And the nature of our work Medical, is uh, dental uh, cancer. Dental cancer yes. And the nature of our work is that there has to be an injury somewhere. It's quite possible that someone has also been unprofessional and even engaged in misconduct that did not result in patient injury, okay. in which case we would have absolutely no business. Mm -hmm. But here there's injury. But you we know that for sure. Um, whether this in injury is on account of failures by these two uh, hospitals is what we would determine. Okay. Now the MDCN would determine whether the conduct of the professionals involved violated ethical standards. And that's a matter of investigation for the MDCN, whether there was injury or not. It's about regulating the professionals, mm -hmm. not about whether someone gets injured by their conduct. This wants to, this wants to take me back to um, uh, Dr. Anu, yes. the um, plastic surgeon, yes. um, who has been suspended uh, by this very M M MDCN. MDCN. Uh, what was the determination? I, I, I didn't want to So distract. what it is is that the subject we were going in to investigate in the first place, um, our investigation and obviously prosecution catalyzed um, the analysis okay. uh, by the MDCN. And MDCN found sufficient basis in what the complaint, the substantive issues were, to say, in the interim, you should be suspended. To the extent that there's a possibility that these complaints uh, or these allegations are factual, okay. you are a danger to your patients. Okay. And as such, we would hold you up while the professional investigation continues and while the regulatory investigation proceeds But also. it was without prejudice. We, well, I, I don't know how the MDCN operates, okay. but I generally think a suspension by its very nature as a matter of law yes. seems to suggest that we're not sure one way or the other that you've done something wrong, but there's enough information for us to stop you from continuing so that Until something terrible doesn't result. happen to someone else. Yes, exactly. And uh, I don't want to confuse it by going into uh, the, 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 what happened um, uh, to that? So, do you know, there's suspension that's a penalty for misconduct. And there's a suspension pending determination of misconduct. I think what we have here is suspension pending determination of misconduct. Well, I'm so sorry about yes, that. Yes, that's okay. You know. um, okay. 
I think I should just take a commercial break now. Okay. So uh, stay with us, please. Um, uh, we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Uh, spending time with uh, Mr. Babatunde Rukera, Executive Vice Chair and CEO of the um, Federal Competition and Consumer Protection uh, Council, formerly um, the Consumer Protection Council. He's told us why there was a need to, you know, you know, expand the operations a bit. And we've been talking about what they do essentially. And um, I had opined that, thank God for an agency like that, uh, but in the sense that um, it's, you know, it's, it's an agency that, belongs to Nigerians and um, if you have a good enough case you don't need to know anybody your case will be taken up usually these kind of things take all sorts of powerful men of timber and caliber before you can even get anybody to look at your case and if I'm hearing you right sir what you seem to be saying is that if the case in our preliminary investigation seems to have merit we will make an inquiry we would even come find you ourselves. <laughs> we would so, come so, find so you there ourselves. you are. Yes. Now, you were telling me about um, uh, the two ladies of the moment, uh, so to speak, unfortunately, and both of them demised, uh, Kweju Ugoma, uh, uh, Premier Hospital of Victoria Island. Now, we haven't spoken about uh, Ms. Uh, Omolara Omoya Jowo, who arrived dead on arrival at uh, Beachland Specialist Hospital. She actually was... That was in Arepo, yes, Ogo State. Yes. Uh, she actually uh, was admitted in Beachland, but was ultimately transferred uh, to a government uh, facility, which was where she was pronounced. They thought the she needed uh, uh, oxygen uh, uh, care at a specialist hospital, right. you know. Right. And so she presented at um, Beachland, uh, purportedly complaining about an ulcer. And uh, from the information that we have also received, that wasn't an uncommon thing for her. It was an existing condition that she had lived with and. Uh, um, we also have an in a doctor who works in the quality assurance department and is our focal person for the patient's bill of rights. And um, the initial information we understand is that um, in the absence of other complications, it is unusual that an ulcer would um, mm -hmm. result in a, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a uh, cardiac emergency that ultimately results in fatality. And so, and uh, that is what investigation shows. Well, that's what appears to have happened. Okay. And so the question is, what was the management of this patient uh, till that cut, till she uh, got, had a cardiac emergency and ultimately died? And by the way, what was the referring system? How was she referred? Was there sufficient information to the? Uh, escalating facility was she referred in an appropriate manner trans, uh, emergency transport and a few other questions that uh, we're hopeful that the answers would help to do one uh, determine what went wrong hold whoever should be accountable accountable but beyond that also um, uh, prevent that from happening again in the future mm. um, actually okay um, I, I guess our viewers out there will probably have one or two questions that they might want to ask Mr. Rukera. So we're going to make time for that. We will open the phones now and uh, please call in so that you could um, make your, you know, your line of inquiry in terms of him <laughs> <laughs> known to him. And I'm sure he'll do his best. Now, in the case of uh, Kweju Woma and uh, Omolara Omoya uh, were, were these um, complaints that you received or discoveries that you made? Both. In, in these two cases, both. Um, so we're monitoring information also. I mean, uh, part of our role is to know what's going on. So just as you're discovering things, real, we're also discovering it real time. And so this information, the, the, the information was coming in from different uh, uh, sources. Uh, we're monitoring it online also. Okay. And because of our role, many people who might know these people are also sending it to us and say, mm -hmm. are you seeing this? Is this, do you know what's going on here? And so we're already, you know, gathering the information and trying to make some sense of it. Wow. And at the same time, uh, people who are close uh, also are providing this as complaints and also giving our contacts to close family relatives to engage us. And so um, most times it's either one or the other happening first, but in this particular situation, they were both okay. fast moving and both were happening about the same time. Okay. Uh, Mazi Okorafo in Arochuku. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Baba Tunde. Yeah. So I want to so I want to find out from you. Now today if you go to the market and pick any of these beverages, you see that the quantity 
It's not up to one spoon when you open the subject. Now, the situation like this now, what do we do? What, where and where can we move in order to do it? Because it is very, very sad that when you get, next time when you come, that either the quantity is less than or greater than what you have presently. And today in Nigeria, if you go to the market, you will see palm oil. That is, is a form of, that, I don't know whether it's tomato, uh, tomato paper or water, colored. And uh, what I'm saying is an experience of what happened, that was in uh, January, February. We went to the market with the one of our colleagues. He said that okay, we to, so we have to buy oil to take it and travel out. It's okay. That you see that about the disaster that they have mixed it. Now I was so surprised. I thought he was joking. No, right. Eh? We later went back and collected a bottle of uh, that very oil. He says mixed and things. We took it to them. When we boiled it and the one we collected, that's a good one. There's okay. a big difference. Okay. Now what is your call? authority to do this consumer behavior that, that, that consumer? To see how they can track such people and so because such amoyen is very very cancerous to human consumption and people are still buying it they don't know so what do it was at a level in this country I don't know how people are so desperate to make money to make it. not only amoyen there are other other things in the market that is so adulterated and people are still buying and dying on okay. their own because they don't oh, know. okay Mazi okay Mazi thank you very much for calling in. Um, uh, I wonder if this hasn't sort of crossed expanded. the expanded the conversation beyond where we were, and it's now gone into standards and uh, it has, dark it and has, uh, it has, standards. It has, you know. But but I mean a quick short answer to that. The first point he makes about um, quantities changing mm -hmm. that's a problem. I mean, and that's a problem, and it's not just Nigeria; it's global, um, and it's one of the things that we're engaging and fighting about right now. What companies are beginning to do is um, reduce what they sell without increasing prices, yes. thinking that the market can take an increase in mm -hmm. price. And so a soap that would have been maybe 500 grams goes down to 400 grams. And it is and not your, so noted on the packaging. Your, yeah, yeah, it, it will be noted on the packaging. That it actually. has come down. Right, because, okay. and, and, and we've pulled up a few companies, large multinationals, and their beverage, you know, like the, for that, uh, or their, their cereal. And, okay. and so what it is is that, so maybe this cereal was 500 grams, but now they're selling 350 gram cereal, but they've retained the price, the, the price okay. and they've retained the package, okay. but they disclose it. But most consumers are not buying based on volume on content, they look at the appearance of yeah. it. And so you're, and, and we sent, uh, when we started seeing a lot of these complaints, we sent people to look. And you'd see that they have a skill as part of the production process and the plan. And you can see that it measures up to what they disclose. However, that's just half the story. The reality of it is that, is there a bait and switch here? Consumers already have it in their minds that, I mean, previously this box of cereal was this amount. The same box of cereal now has less. And then the company says, we didn't lie to you. This is what we're selling. And so one of the regulations we're writing now is we're going to insist when there's a material change to any term, including the term of a contract, includes mm -hmm. the amount mm -hmm. or the volume of the content. Mm -hmm. You must disclose it. Okay. Um, uh, Ibrahim in Kaduna, uh, good morning. Good morning, Uncle Yori. Good morning, Good morning, sir. morning to Mr. Urukera. Thank you very much for calling in. In fact, this is a very nice and good topic you brought here this morning to us. See, we, in, especially, we only look at this very topic, you have to go from up to down. You see, one thing I just want us to talk about is this. They only look at the consumer, those in the urban area. What about those in the rural area? These are the real people that all these things we buy from. I'm not very happy with this very topic this morning, but I'm on the second side, I'm also happy. I will not talk to look into this because why? Many things go wrong concerning production and consumer. You see, consuming what we are consuming today, we are consuming poison, not really... Uh, I mean something we are thinking of. The government needs to set up all those things and we are supposed to set up this thing in the local level, not in the urban level. If it happens that they have the director in the, in the, in the, in the urban level, let them also have their branches down from the state, down to the local government and indeed, if possible, to the world level. Okay. So that this is the only way for us that we try to eradicate all those menace and diseases that we are involved in. See, do you know why we are having all those numerous diseases here and there? 
In the olden days, it's not like this. Our forefathers, the only the if any visitors come, they treated themselves. But today, when you go to Australia, they say this is what happened. This is what you have. There's all various types of diseases today, and this is the cause. So okay. Also, I will thank, th thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. In the thank it's oh. the right time for Nigeria to do what is right for us. To deliver up on this better. Thank you very much, and God help us. Bye. Thank you very much, Ibrahim, for calling in. I was going to say, let me find out from Mr. You know, uh, Irukera, uh, what he wants to say about that, that um, the urbanites might be enjoying themselves, but in the rural areas, uh, how concerned are you and do you have the reach? Far more concerned. Far more concerned. And um, we don't have the reach. Uh, the FCCPC has a total of nine offices and one in each geopolitical zone, and then there's an office in Lagos because of its size, and there's an office in Kano because of its size, and then there's a headquarters in Abuja. But in, in, in order to try and make that reach, the offices in the geopolitical zones are not even in the main cities. The only main city uh, office in the geopolitical zone would be Port Harcourt for South South. Instead of going to a place like um, Onicha or some uh, or Abba. In the southeast, we've gone to Oka. In the northeast, we've gone to Bauchi. In the northwest, we decided to go to Katsina instead of Kaduna or Kanu. And, and in the north central, we're in Mina. And the reason is trying to bring this somewhat closer to people. But the good thing is that under the FCCPA, which, I, like I said, was promulgated in 2019, there is an encouragement to open more offices. The reality of it is that a regulator of this nature needs to be in every state, perhaps have some kind of a presence in every local government, and not necessarily an office, but some kind of a working uh, presence. But at the end of the day, I, th I think the most important way to hold um, uh, people who sell anything accountable is to hold them, hold them themselves, not necessarily go to the consumers. And so one of the things we're doing, with this, starting with the large multinationals, is that if you can find a way to market your products and get it into the homes of people in the rural areas, surely you must find a way to provide some minimal consumer education about their rights or the risks associated with consumption of your product, mm -hmm. and most importantly, an enforcement mechanism when they're dissatisfied with the product. Indeed. And I think that over a period of time we would make a better impact. Uh, Mr. Amechi in Anambra, good morning, sir. Good morning, Uncle Yuri. Thank you very much. For and coming. good morning, Mr. Arukera. Oh, no. I'm in the building industry. And I don't know whether the agency, this consumer protection, is actually looking into the prices of cement that has more or less gone <laughs> through the roof. You know, and it, I think it's because of the monopoly being enjoyed by maybe... Uh, a particular cement industry because if you notice some other cement factories have gone into oblivion how are they protecting us you know from such monopoly thank you very much for calling in mr mechi Th thank you so much my brother and and that's a very important question i'd be surprised if i wasn't put on the spot <laughs> with respect to that question a few days ago i finally made the headlines i've never been on the <laughs> front pages i made the headlines in guardian um, where some Guardian journalists said that cement prices have gone through the roof and uh, the Consumer Protection Authority is keeping mum, mm -hmm. meaning we're being quiet. Mm. And it turns out that a few days to that publication, I got a text from some um, journalist who writes for Guardian Femi, I forget what his name is, who said he wanted to talk to me about cement prices. And I said, sure. Um, that we could set a time. The next thing I saw was a publication. He never asked me any questions. I thought it was absolutely irresponsible of him to, um, uh, and Guardian too, their editorial conduct to put that kind of a thing on the front page without gathering all the information, I think is less than ideal. But the point is absolutely uh, correct. And um, Correct that, um, that cement, cement prices, prices have, gone, have gone through the and roof. People are complaining about that you were, there is a... That you were mum is the part that you... There's, I mean, what was the question? He didn't ask me any question. He just said he wants to talk to me about... Um, I mean, I'm a, I, I've got a lot of things. Yes, and you I'm didn't doing, get to talk, and, and then he said you were mom. Most responsible journalists will say, okay, here are their questions. Mm -hmm. And this is the, these are the issues we're looking at and would like you to address one, two, three. You send me a three-line text, and then the next thing is you write a headline and say I'm mom. And people have thought that I should respond to it, and I think, I, I think it is... Um, 
it serves no purpose and it's pointless to even credit that with a, with a response. Uh, but here's what we're doing with respect to cement. And um, it's very tricky in the sense that uh, everybody just has a perception about what is going on. Mm -hmm. And sadly, we think that there are one or two people, they're so big and they're above regulation. And, and that they've become know, virtual and, monopolies. And by, this, by that token, and I suspect that that's the, um, that's the portrayal this journalist was trying to convey by saying that the regulator is mom. But what I found out is that the reality uh, no matter how much perception uh, mirrors reality, it's still different from the reality. And now we've actually been looking in the cement industry and looking in the sugar industry, by the way. And uh, we've opened investigations into both. The one thing that I found out in cement, for instance, we've, there have been investigations in sister countries who we have strong relationships with their consumer, um, with their competition authorities, and we're gathering information from their own investigations to help us also. And that's how things happen uh, globally. Uh, the one thing that, the first thing I have seen with respect to cement in what we've looked at is that there is an incredible disparity between the X factory price and the retail price. And as a competition regulator, what you go to, you follow the trail and first see what the problem is. And so if there is a huge disparity between X factory and retail, then you want to scrutinize distribution. It is when you fix that, that the, if the problem doesn't go away, then you come back down and say, what is happening at production level? Because distribution, unless a distribution network is owned by a manufacturer, distribution itself is hardly ever a market entry, uh, a market barrier. Um, so long as the di distribution process is sufficiently democratized between uh, um, manufacturers, then it's hardly ever a barrier to entry. And so what we're looking at is, what is causing this? Why are these prices very different in different parts of the country? And we've got all kinds of excuses transportation and all kinds of things, but it's a methodical approach. Are they excuses or reasons? Well, because it's an investigation that goes to corporate behavior and potential corporate reputation, mm -hmm. I would not speak to what I think it could be okay. until we make findings. But whatever the case may be, we're addressing it, but primarily from why it is retailing so high. Yes. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the X factory price in itself is very low. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm addressing the disparity between the X factory price and the retail exactly. price. And because so that's where to start okay. uh, a, a market correction. Or else you just, you're, we're not policemen. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we're market economists Again, in some everything sense. Everything will depend on your investigation because um, I've also heard, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, very, very high up management uh, people from within the cement, cement industry, one particular one, who was saying that nothing has changed from the factory. We've not done anything to increase the price from the factory. So from what it was that, no, that people took as normal up to now, it's like, duh, you're going to have to investigate that. Right, and we are. And, we are. and, and, and for us, um, the distribution, the retailers have far less investment compared to the manufacturer. And so if the, if the, if the margins are because they are manipulating um, supply into the market, that's against the law and we'll go against them there. But again, we can't just wake up, the prices are high, and then just start whacking people. Yeah. There must be a method to our madness. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. I want to thank you very much. But I also want to find out, uh, Peju Boma and um, Omalara uh, Omod Yadjo, both of blessed memory, what's the next step? No. Good, very good. So we've opened the investigation. We've issued what you call the notice of commencement of investigation and summons to produce to all the relevant parties. And that includes hospitals, that includes even individuals. And so we, there's a timeline to that. And usually we get a lot of information. That's tons of documents. That would be all kinds of pieces of information. And then we would analyze this information. And when we analyze this information, more than likely, more than likely, in this case, we will proceed to hearings. And hearings will be taking testimony, evidence from the relevant people, family, doctors, professionals, experts, all kinds of other people. And then we'll make a finding. Uh, some of our findings will be recommendations. Some will translate to orders. Well, um, uh, you know, thank you very much, uh, 
uh, Tunde Urukera for coming on. I now see that even if we had two hours, we'd be hard pressed <laughs> given all the things that I'd like for you to yes. air. But I want to thank you all the same for coming on and wish you all the best in this, this service and this job that you are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very on. much. Thank you. Okay, so that's our program uh, for the day and the week, actually. As you know, we don't do weekends, but we'll see you, God willing, on Monday with a fresh uh, edition of the program. Um, Yori Falani. But just before I go, I always do that, my mantra, you know, wear your face masks, consider taking the jab if you haven't already. You've got to keep on washing your hands and um, you've got to socially distance. Yeah, I think I covered most of the important ones. Uh, so that's it. Have a great weekend. I'll see you on Monday.